Hello everyone. Good to see you again for another hardware.io webinar. My name is Harshit and I'm a part of hardware.io team. First of all, I would like to share some hardware.io news. Among other things, this Wednesday we started our Berlin online training. Today we finished the third day of our hands-on training and students are very excited to do even more practice on the last day. And now about the webinar, we are happy to have Phil and Joel with us today who both are security architects at Bloomberg. Today's webinar will answer the questions of how to align all the partners in the supply chain to achieve product security goals without cost ballooning beyond reasons. Their presentation will focus uh, as such on the practical design and implementation of zero trust supply chains for electronic products. As usually, today's webinar will consist of 30 minutes technical talk and 10 minutes of question answer. If you have any questions, please send them across via Zoom chat. We will answer them after the presentation is complete. So without any further delay, I would like to invite Joel and Phil to start for their session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's just uh, share the screen. All right, hopefully everyone's able to see that. Yeah, we can. So, oh shit, thank you very much for the intro. So um, for those of you who are uh, in continental Europe, thank you for stopping by at six o'clock on a Friday. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. For the rest of you, uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, my uh, my name is Phil Vashon, and uh, of course, I'm here with Joel Even. Yeah, and uh, we're in the, as, as Hush had said, we are in the security architecture office uh, at Bloomberg. And we're going to talk to you about something that is very near and dear to our hearts and has become a very hot topic, especially on the software side, which is how do you deal with integrity of supply chain and how do you avoid and, and manage any sort of compromise in that? So first and foremost, I guess there's a, a reasonable question of why is Bloomberg interested in this? So Bloomberg is the leader in data, of financial data, especially news that drives the financial markets. Our core product is the Bloomberg terminal. Uh, and the Bloomberg terminal is a means by which analysts and traders around the world can analyze and make decisions around decades of data, a deep collection of highly refined information about what drives the economy. Uh, by providing access to this data, you know, ranging from market ticks through to uh, novel products that have been derived from satellite imagery, the Bloomberg terminal helps users get a complete picture of what is going on around the world. We're also a news agency with our own media arm that reports on the latest news from bureaus in major cities worldwide. News is delivered via the terminal, our TV station, and our radio stations around the world and around the country. Bloomberg's users range from tiny proprietary trading funds through to the largest banks in the world. We're in libraries and academic institutions as well. Our hardware is so iconic that it has actually landed in the Smithsonian Institution, and you might have seen it in HBO's Billions or on the newsroom. The Bloomberg keyboard and B unit are the first things our clients touch when they log into our services, and we place a great deal of pride in their look and feel and how tightly they are integrated into our user experience while enabling us to keep our users' data secure. So why is Bloomberg so interested in secure hardware? Well, we designed into our hardware products, something we refer to as BSAT, or the Bloomberg Secure Authentication Technology. BSAT provides a biometric second factor for accessing all our services for both subscribers and employees. Using identity as a second factor pervades our entire ecosystem of products and our services. So how does BSAT fit into our authentication ecosystem? Well, we use BSAT in our web single sign-on, terminal login, as Phil mentioned, to our financial market data application and all employee internal services. We have infrastructure in our data centers that are secure, that know all about the device at all stages of its life cycle. So ultimately, we need to build up some sort of secure channel between our secure data centers and the device themselves. So it's clear how we need to protect the identity and connectivity and ensure the integrity of all devices we build. So identity is a core part of who we are and user identity is essential to securing all aspects of our business. We must keep our BSAT devices secure and prevent attackers who have physical possession of their device in all stages of its life cycle from tampering with them in ways that could compromise our trust of the second factor of identity that we use these devices to verify. So that gives you a little bit of background on why. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what. 
So historically, whenever we'd reason around a trusted device, especially something that is identity bearing or key material bearing, we think about developing an envelope in which any component that's contained in that envelope would be considered trustworthy or being allowed to actually handle sensitive materials. Typically, this would be built up of components off the shelf and you'd rely on some actual mechanical envelope to help pr protect your electronic components. This could be, for example, uh, an anti-tamper mesh that wraps a canister or simply components that are potted in epoxy. Of course, this model is best exemplified by the IBM 4758. Uh, this is about a 20 year old design now, so it's uh, got a bit of heritage behind it. But this is a very good example of this entire trust model that we think about. So these devices consisted of a carrier board that was a PCI board, and uh, then a canister that contained all the trusted components. Everything inside of that canister was manufactured in a trusted facility with employees that have gone through extensive background checks and continuous monitoring of who is on the factory floor when and how, and even who has been allowed to alter or change any of the processes on that floor. This device itself, as you can see, consisted of largely components off the shelf. This was an AMD Elan 486 a system on a chip. Gluing it to an ISA bus um, was a, a, an off the shelf CPLD. Uh, there was a microcontroller to help implement certain aspects of the security model, which was just an off the shelf Atmel controller. And then the IBM UltraCypher cryptographic accelerator, which actually at the time was an off the shelf component used to accelerate DES and RSA operations. Of course, this is all very much untrusted if we were to have this device running in the open. So how we actually confer trust is the fact that this device was manufactured in a facility that had all of these controls around it to ensure that only people who are authorized and trustworthy were actually involved in producing this system. In addition to this, to ensure that the device continued to remain secure throughout its life cycle, there are multiple sensors in order to detect if someone was trying to change the behavior of the device to extract its keys. From the most basic, a gore anti-tamper wrap was used to detect if someone was trying to pierce the metal canister, which you can see we definitely did when we were taking this one apart. Uh, and uh, this would actually allow the CPLD to very rapidly destroy any key material that was contained in memory. One important factor to remember here is that the IBM 4758 had batteries on board to preserve any of the memory, any of the keys in memory. So if you powered off the device or removed it even physically from a server, those batteries would still be keeping all of that anti-tamper circuitry, as well as all of the keys that are sensitive to the device uh, alive and in memory. Some other interesting countermeasures. This device actually has a plastic scintillator in it that's connected up to a photodiode. Certain types of attacks that are designed to make bits stick in RAM would involve bombarding the device with high, high energy ionizing radiation. Of course, this would actually be detected by this plastic scintillator, allowing the lattice uh, CPLD or other components to very rapidly uh, destroy that key material. Finally, uh, temperature extremes were also a consideration because in the event that you manage to get the device to an extremely low temperature, you might be able to get certain bits to stick in RAM which then you could remove physically the component from the board and then plop it in something that would allow you to read the bits uh, as they were. Of course, this is uh, a very complex attack and a very easy countermeasure exists where you monitor the temperature gradient of the device itself. Physics is our friend. A device is typically, or, or something that's as dense as this, typically will not change temperature very quickly. So as soon as that temperature gradient starts moving upwards, the device was able to actively tamper and clamp and destroy any of bits of data that were sensitive. Of course, since uh, the IBM 4758, which was about 20 years ago again, we've learned a lot and attackers have become more sophisticated without becoming that much more complex. And uh, Joel, I'll let you uh, yeah. talk about some of this. So we wanted to highlight a few examples of the sorts of things we're up against building secure devices. Um, in this talk, some of you may or may not have seen at Woot in 2018 at Usenix by the Technical University of Berlin, they illustrated just how they could reverse engineer and intercept communications from a biometric mainstream fingerprint sensor. Uh, furthermore, they were able to completely remove that sensor after reverse engineering the sensor protocol, take a picture of a fingerprint with a phone off of the surface of a payment card, take a picture of a latent print, create an extraction process 
basically generate that biometric template, which is a representation of the fingerprint, um, one-way representation, and generate a digital dummy finger in the sensor format. And so at this point, with an FPGA interposed on the board, they were able to inject and replay this fingerprint at will. Of course, this exposes a weakness in that sort of sensor. Image data was neither confidential or authenticated, nor can the sensor device itself be authenticated. Um, another thing we, want, we definitely want to highlight is uh, talking about counterfeits. So, you know, consumer devices often rely on merchant commodity silicon, which tends to receive less scrutiny, specifically high volumes of these commodity parts in center device counterfeiting. Um, making determinations of counterfeit devices is both costly, costly and time consuming and is directly at odds with the price points that all of this sort of commodity consumer device stuff has to be delivered. Time to market requirements also have come into play. You just may not have the time necessary to, to differentiate all these things. So you might be getting your parts directly from the vendor. Great, you still have problems, but supply chains all over the world have been affected by COVID-19. And so if you're getting parts from distribution, you might be forced to look into third parties or other channels that you aren't typically used to looking into acquire components. So on a lot to lot or even order to order basis coming from so many different sources, detecting counterfeits can take measures of time and money we just aren't prepared to spend. And distribution of these parts doesn't even, uh, we haven't even mentioned possible interdiction um, with the NSA revelations of, of the past that uh, you know shipments can be intercepted and you have to consider that too. So here we have an example of a commodity part in the SD micro STM32 family. Uh, these, these devices have received their fair share of knockoffs and counterfeits. They're ARM Cortex microcontrollers. Um, as you can see, the one on the left there, that's a part number, that inscription there on that part is, that's not even a real part number. Um, so maybe you, you, you're not even looking at that, but that's a quick visual observation, right? That's pretty easy to tell if you make the time to go look at it. Now, on the right, some clones are much harder to identify. Both of these chips are labeled correctly as parts that do exist in SD Micro's catalog. Um, but which one of these components is fake? Can you tell which? Well, clearly it's the one on the right, right? Um, you can see that there are two dimples in the upper left and lower right corner. Um, these are not the pin one markers actually in the lower left by the, the point on the PCBA, you can see the pin one. So what gives? Well, someone's knocking these off and their packaging facility ejector pins are leaving marks in their, <clears throat> in their package. Um, ST parts do not have these representative markings from the packaging process. So next level sort of detection of counterfeits, more visual observation, but perhaps more subtle, but we all knew that, right? So Mark Taranapur et al with the University of Florida have done great work in the analysis and detection of electronic component counterfeiting and tampering. Um, here we have a taxonomy of counterfeits, many of which we already touched on earlier in this talk. So these can all be of a concern, but I'd just like to highlight a few. Um, for example, recycled parts. Um, recycled parts would be considered legitimate parts. They were produced by the vendor they said they're from, but they would come with reliability, handling, and even functionality questions. If they're recycled, who had them? What are they doing with them? That could lead to security questions. Um, defective parts. You know, as someone who consumes security features of silicon devices, um, this is a particular interest to us, obviously. If they're defective, what's defective? Are they leaking? You know, are countermeasures that the vendors are now putting in their chips to prevent, you know, statistical power analysis failing? Um, are timing attacks more prone to succeed because certain parts of the security mechanisms are failing? You know, what exactly is defective? So this is a huge particular interest. And then we talk about cloned parts, just like the SD micro parts. Those were not made by SD micro or their fabs. Um, while they represent to have the same functionality, again, if you're doing an AES or RSA or maybe an ECC encryption, maybe there's hardware, maybe there's not, but you, you basically don't know what's going on inside if, if, if they, they cloned it. I mean, if it's an exact copy of the mask, okay, maybe it works the same, but you don't know what's been done to that. And then finally tampered, which is um, of a huge concern. These are parts that SD Micro say would make if we're talking about SD Micro, not to call them out, but just as our illustration. Um, and then somehow either at packaging or at um, test or wafer test, things were altered, right? And we want to reduce those tampered parts, the risk of that we want to reduce getting into our finished goods. So authenticating the parts that we can in system can mitigate this. And we'll get into more details how we can do that. But some of these are bigger threat to a than others to a commercial product. Um, Mark and his team have done a great job of categorizing these issues into things that would also be of extreme importance in areas like medical, 
military, aerospace, um, just outside of the consumer space. You know, things are going to touch 20 different hands on the supply chain. So in light of all these ways a component could be counterfeit, what can we detect or how can we detect things? Again, fundamentally, it would come down to verifying measurable or observable properties of the device. Um, let's start with the physical aspects. You know, various visual inspections ranging from cursory observations of a part number like we illustrated or the package differences down to measuring physical dimensions of the package, the dye, material properties of the leads or package, what type of material. I mean, you could do whatever you want, but that's time and money that you might not have. Now let's get into electrical testing. Measuring the electrical performance, does power and current consumption fall into expected parameters? Um, things that aren't authentic could uh, yield differences here because they would have been made on different processes or with different materials. Um, speed and signaling characteristics, propagation delay, rise, fall, et cetera. And then just your, your fault testing or failure analysis testing. So great, we have a complete battery of tests we could do on all incoming silicon. Well, not so fast. So uh, after all thinking about all of that and realizing that <clears throat> components off the shelf are actually very difficult to achieve uh, this all in, uh, let's take another extreme and let's look at the YubiKey here. And the reason why we popped this, or well, someone popped this poor YubiKey open uh, was to reveal this Infineon secure microcontroller that's on board. There's a single component in this YubiKey and that single component uh, is, is where all of the security and all of the uh, trust actually is held. So. By doing this, what you've done is you've reduced the physical domain over which you would have to address those physical integrity uh, over. Uh, and uh, in turn, you've also reduced the attack surface. Now, uh, where this gets interesting is that some of the actual countermeasures that we discussed with the IBM 4758, such as anti-tamper meshes, actually are implemented in this device. Just it's a special metal layer at the top of the, uh, on top of the Infineon part that actually uh, implements, for example, the anti-tamper mesh. So long as there's power to the device, it will be able to detect that someone has breached that. Or even when you power the device on for the first time after breaching it, it will be able to detect it. It's imperfect, of course, because we don't always have power. So you won't be able to destroy keys if the device is offline. Uh, but it certainly presents interesting opportunities to achieve similar levels of assurance. So this is in another extreme from the, uh, from the IBM 4758. But it does introduce an important concept, which is now we can actually get parts that can hold their trust you know, within the actual silicon that implements the device itself. So, so long as you have some way to have assurance of who or what device you're, you're talking to through some trust anchors or something like that, maybe we can create a sea of components that then we're able to establish trustworthiness of. So oh, there, uh, oh, oh, go sorry, ahead, go ahead, Joel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So there are various attack vectors and threats that you must consider during uh, manufacturing supply chain component delivery as long as the as well as the whole device life cycle. And so we've highlighted a few here for consideration. Um, during component subassembly or product engineering, maybe backdoor could be introduced, um, designed into the product as it were. Uh, perhaps security properties could be disabled or programmable code on a subassembly that you get from a vendor. A nice backdoor would be uh, really, really good to slip in there. Um, moving down, we would talk about silicon fabrication. Okay, you've designed it, now you're gonna fab it. Let's say at that point, everything's good. Well, you're gonna tape out your design and then what about GDS2 file tampering, the file format typically used to deliver ASICs to, uh, to fab houses to make. Um, you know, even after the, even if the GDS2 file wasn't tampered with, perhaps a mask set could have been substituted. Um, this can be complex and costly to identify. These are very high bar attacks, but possible. Um, one might also be concerned about wafer test. You know, after silicon fab, then you go down to the wafer test level where chip alter could be, chip behavior could be altered by fuse programming or test vectors could be altered. Um, moving further down the silicon supply chain, packaging is often done by a third party. So now we could consider legitimate dyes being sent to packaging that have been tested, but that additional dyes have been wired in, multi-chip packages um, are, are a thing useful and used by some vendors, but Maybe the package people could insert a die in there. Is that gonna cause a problem? Well, we certainly don't want that. Again, there may be ways to identify that, but they're time consuming and costly. So pushing the trust into the silicon can help mitigate this. Now, what about things like a power management IC or a power supply? 
this is a commodity component that are on the orders of millions or billions of, of chips sold and moving around per year. Um, that's not going to happen anytime soon, pushing trust into something like that. So all of these components, generally speaking, go on a, PCD, a PCB. Um, some things to consider would be additional components buried on the PCB, altered nets, layout, you know, changed from your specifications, bringing out buried nets or layers, and, and specifically intercepting and modifying data flowing throughout the system. So even once you get out of the uh, subassembly concerns, uh, especially for silicon components or the PCBs, uh, you get into the concern about just logistics around any pre-assembled subassemblies, components even, uh, or the finished goods. Countless hands will touch any sort of package that is in transit and will actually be involved in delivering those finished goods to their various locations. You need to make sure that Whenever a subassembly is in transit, this will not actually compromise the integrity of the product when it's assembled at its final integration. As you take a product that you've finished uh, in your, and you have a finished good and you've packaged it and all that, you want to make sure that interdiction, which could be the NSA, but more likely is someone trying to make a buck or two by substituting in uh, lower cost or less functional components, um, you need to make sure that that impact is easily detectable and measurable. An additional challenge that uh, you'll face is uh, when you're actually assembling a subassembly or the finished good, you have to consider that your manufacturing facility is probably not to the level of trustworthiness of that that the IBM 4758 was built in. And that's simply because of cost and the practicalities of hiring people to run the production lines. The actual technicians on the line, usually it's a revolving door. And sometimes after big holidays, they don't even come back. So they're hiring anyone off the street who can actually replace that role. Because you don't really have control over who is running it, uh, running the factory and who is running the uh, actual manufacturing process at the time, uh, it becomes very difficult to make any assertions about who actually built a particular uh, finished good. And in turn, that made, would make it very difficult to make any security assessments unless you have any sort of uh, information about the, the assemblies themselves involved. Another challenge, which is especially unique to systems that bear identity, but in general for IoT devices is going to be increasingly an issue, is dealing with the device provisioning process itself. When your, your device first comes online it's, as a finished good, you are going to want to do something to verify that all the components on that device are authentic. And you are gonna to wanna to make sure that actually is a device that you expect it to be manufactured. So you're gonna to wanna to tie that back to lot dates, manufacturing dates, all the kinds of checks that actually help you get a strong assurance that this device was intended to be. What this actually enables is an assurance that whatever device you're handing an identity to after you've verified all of these factors uh, is actually something you intended to build and is actually one of your devices and not someone trying to siphon off false identities that they can use later on. This is also a very effective way of preventing the or detecting the uh, additional units being run uh, post uh, shift. You know, you, you typically on a manufacturing floor, you'll have three shifts well, what's, what's the harm in throwing a fourth shift in there to make a few extra units for some other purpose? And uh, last but not least, <clears throat> we still have to worry about all these things, plus the time that the device spends in the user's possession. We're talking about a security device in our case, and uh, that means that while the user has that physically in their possession, they have effectively infinite time to attack and try to extract the secrets from this. So of all of these considerations before, we also have to make sure we isolate the blast radius of any sort of single device being compromised. If a user manages to extract keys from one uh, identity bearing device, this should not compromise the entirety of the system nor other devices themselves. So we've enumerated a number of threats and, and really one of the things that becomes clear is you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. Uh, and you know, if we had infinite time and infinite money, there would be all kinds of mechanisms we could go through. And in fact, some companies like Apple have very effective programs in order to ensure the integrity of the silicon that they manufacture. Uh, unfortunately, if you're dependent on merchant silicon, you really have to consider where you can actually draw lines to ensure the integrity of your products. So where we think about things is semiconductor design is a complex product. There are lots of engineers involved in producing merchant silicon uh, that ranges from people producing RTL and design, doing the placement and layout of uh, the silicon and so forth. Uh, there are lots of best practices that a vendor can follow in terms of design management, design lifecycle management, design verification and so forth. Uh, these help, uh, but they're not a cure. And anyone who is in the information security industry probably hears everyone wringing their hands about the insider threat. 
This is one of the hardest challenges to solve because if someone has privileged access to a system or a design, it's very difficult to actually detect if they've tampered with it in a way that uh, alters your design sufficiently. But the upshot of this is that these, these attacks are actually really high cost. So this is relegated a little bit into the nation state territory and has to be someone who really specifically wants to attack that part. The other uh, really challenging area to protect uh, against tampering is in the silicon manufacturing side of things. As Joel alluded to, the startup costs, so like tape out, mass production, so forth, very expensive, very complex processes. Many vendors are involved in this uh, stage. Um, and then as well in production, you know, once you have a set of masks, could someone alter them? Uh, could someone substitute different designs in place? Um, these are really expensive attacks and very complex attacks to pull off. Um, ATE attacks so for automated test equipment involved in silicon production uh, are actually a bit of a lower bar. It's all software that defines these things, uh, but it would still require an insider to actually pull this off successfully more than likely. So again, these attacks are very high cost to pull off and very targeted as well. It, it's not likely that you're just gonna get swept up in someone's watering hole attack. There, there probably is a good reason why they're trying to compromise this design. So what we've said is we can't really defend against these effectively, uh, but what we can do is focus on the downstream risks. At all the stages where either a finished piece of silicon is being handled and packaged through to our finished goods getting into clients' hands. So we uh, know we can, mitigate a lot of the risks in the logistics process. Um, and we also know that we can mitigate a lot of the risks in the semiconductor supply chain. And uh, we can even uh, reduce the risk of certain types of attacks during uh, the, the, the actual life cycle of the device where it's in consumer hands. So knowing these things, let's focus on the problems we can solve rather than the problems that will be very costly and very difficult, but very interesting to solve as well. So building on that. At the end of the day, we are making a device, right? We need to deliver that to our customers and employees that facilitates interaction and use of our services. Um, we must take our constraints with security as a primary goal, but we have to balance budget, usability, and time to market with the overarching constraint of security, as mentioned, and the securing the supply chain. We must meet or exceed all of our established baseline security requirements while ensuring the device addresses our threat model. So threat model is key. As Phil said, we're probably not going up against nation states. That's not something we're considering. We must balance the usability of the device, keeping in mind that employees, including ourselves and customers alike, will be using this product. It must be friendly to use or by our target population, or it will cause other time and cost issues of support and things like that. And budget. Budget is a key factor that must be weighed as well. There's a cost to design cost to build and total cost of ownership to say the least that all need to be optimized based on available available budget. And last but not least, one must consider the time to market requirements, both internal and external time pressures from businesses to component availability must all be balanced to ensure timely delivery of a new product. So I put these in here and this is zero trust is always a very dangerous buzzword to throw in there. So we, we were very loath to use this by the way in the talk description but uh, it seems to have the impact or at least uh, renders people curious. But there are three very interesting principles that apply to most zero trust systems if you cut through the marketing buzzwords. <clears throat> and that is that any component of a system that um, you know, is a part of a zero trust, so-called zero trust system uh, must have its integrity and identity explicitly verified. So what that means is that before any component of a zero trust system can actually interact or be trusted enough, at least with, to interact with other components, with whatever its responsibility is, uh, we make sure that it is what we expect it to be. Is it a fingerprint sensor? Is it ex the microcontroller you expect or so forth? Uh, the other principle that's very helpful is to assume that everything is compromised. And you know, as we said before, you have to draw a line in the sand to the level of compromise you're willing to try to detect and, and have countermeasures against. But by making that core assumption, you're actually going to uh, be much more cautious about how you trust the individual components of a system and also will uh, limit the responsibilities that those components have, which leads very nicely into the last point, which is you will apply the principle of least privilege. So any component won't be doing more than it needs to or more than it should be. It has a very specific role or responsibility in a system and uh, it should never be able to do more than what it needs to do uh, to achieve that role. But these principles become very crucial in actually guiding the design like this. 
And so taking this to the, the, the actual implementation step, if you consider the diagram we had before where we kind of drew this big red trust envelope around the device and said, well, this is what we trust. Uh, in fact, what we can now do is reduce this to a trusted base. So an individual set of components that actually um, represent you know, trustworthy or critical operations that a system is going to perform. And by doing that, we can also figure out what components need to bear an identity and what components need to have a secure channel between those individual systems and what components will actually be involved in uh, making any sort of critical policy decisions. Following on top of that, we also have another consideration, which is how do we manage data that needs to be stored in an untrusted environment? For example, flash memory or uh, a RAM chip, it doesn't actually have any sort of identity or any sort of security measures usually built into it. So we have to consider how we protect data that we might be writing out to long-term storage. So in that vein, uh, we actually have to look at what are our trusted bases in a system. So what are the components that we have to consider trustworthy as a part of achieving our security objectives? So. Yeah, so we just talked about how important identity is to us in our core business to start things off anyways. And our use of a biometric sensor is absolutely critical to our policy decisions of establishing the identity of our users to let them into the system, to let our employees into internal systems. So to extend our trusted base into the biometric sensor means that we should first, as Phil said, we must verify the identity and authenticity of said sensor. Second, we must establish a secure tamper-proof channel for communication and normal operation of the sensor. And then our microcontroller. So our secure microcontroller also makes policy decisions. Our biometric matching, for example, is done in there. We verify those biometric factors and handle key material in the secure microcontroller. To extend our trust into this microcontroller means authenticating the device itself before loading firmware and then loading trust anchors as well as the firmware itself over a secure channel. We must also be able to assert that all the security controls designed into the device itself are functioning correctly, secure boot, cryptographic engines, or any abilities to detect tamper, et cetera. So as I was alluding to before, flash and RAM have no identity. Uh, there's not really a concept of a secure channel for most types of memories. Uh, but what we want to do is get away from having to worry about these devices as being part of our trusted base and how they uh, function and actually just say anything that is tampering with flash or RAM is actually a reliability problem. So it will just brick a device or uh, prevent it from working as expected or as long as expected it was to work for. Uh, but we want to say this is not a security risk. And so one of the ways we accomplish this is many secure microcontrollers today actually have one-time programmable memory where you can write out uh, for example, uh, keys that will be used to decrypt flash transparently and authenticate anything that's read in from flash or RAM. This is very important because it's not a high bar of attack to attach a logic analyzer or some other device to an external bus to extract secrets. Other components like the PCB, uh, power management chips and so on, uh, we do not consider them a part of the trusted base. And that is because we've now said that the components that are critical to our system to achieve our security objectives are actually uh, going to have that, uh, that, level, that zero trust uh, level of verification of identity and uh, principle of least privilege. So we can say that by listening in or trying to initiate communications across the connection between the microcontrol and the biometric sensor, uh, you won't get much because hopefully that's encrypted uh, as designed and then it's, it's, it's authenticated that data. So even tampering with it in flight won't achieve very much. Uh, additionally, uh, the flash and RAM, uh, the channel between those are actually going to be carrying wrapped and authenticated data that will be coming out of the microcontroller. So again, anything stored at rest is, is effectively protected through those measures. So by reducing our trusted base to those components and then having that level of assurance and, and uh, encryption between the components, uh, we're actually able to say, we don't care if someone alters the PCB. It's a reliability problem. The devices might fail sooner uh, or maybe not perform within the specifications we expected uh, for the, for, you know, for example, reliability or for uh, EM uh, emissions and so on. And uh, really all that does is say, allow us to reduce it to a quality problem, which is actually an excellent position to be in. So uh, we came up with this model at Bloomberg and um, it's really dictated how we interact with our vendors. And the key point of this is actually we engage with our vendors as early as possible. 
we like to work with our vendors to understand what their upcoming products look like, understand the, what their current customers, in addition to ourselves, uh, might be expecting or looking for, and try to influence them in order to add uh, additional features or capabilities into that design that will allow us to achieve our security objectives. This can be challenging because uh, we obviously have to keep well ahead of the life cycle of uh, any semiconductors being produced, but also have to have a good idea of where we need to go in terms of the capabilities of our devices. Uh, one of the other things that's been an interesting experience with vendors in general is that security, especially when you get to embedded systems, has kind of always been an afterthought until recently. So we like to work very closely with our vendors to educate them on secure design principles, on cryptography, on any of the aspects of the design that we feel are going to be critical for us achieving our goals in the end. Sometimes it's just a matter of working with a vendor to establish best practices or what does the bring up process look like for a component that we're about to integrate. So there are a number of points of engagement where we can achieve our security objectives by working with vendors so that they can build a more secure product in general. In addition, we really like to do co-design. So sometimes we will identify that there is a part that is capable of achieving our security objectives, but we just need to work with the vendor to enhance it and add capabilities. And so we like to collaborate with, we like to specify something and then collaborate with vendors to actually figure out how to implement it and achieve our uh, requirements overall. So this is also a big part of our engagement process. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, and after the design stage just mentioned co-design, for example, one must verify what was implemented was done so correctly. Um, all the co-design and education can, can be great, but then if you deliver something that doesn't match what you intended, um, that's a fail. So failing to close this loop on verification can result in costly delays if problems are discovered later after you've fabbed silicon, after you've burned mask ROMs or OTP or fused parts. Um, you have a bug in a mask ROM. Did you fuse the wrong thing? Did you forget to verify all your keys are on the right curves? Um, you know, off, off curve key attacks are, are a real thing. So did, they, did the education we gave them on cryptography that they may have been lacking pay off? And then auditing. So as Phil mentioned numerous times, dealing with a contract manufacturer is exciting. You may not know who's on the line, but they're incentivized to make as many of your product as fast as they can with the least amount of work. Their, their value add is to build it and time is money. So they always seem to create new and unique ways in their mind to optimize our requirements to lower their labor time and costs. This necessarily isn't a malicious thing, but this comes at the expense sometimes of prescribed security practices and manufacturing steps that you've specified. Continual audit of manufacturing steps and processes are required to ensure this integrity and that the identity is being respected at all stages. And then finally, let's say you've built a device, you've audited, everything was done right in your factory. Now you have to monitor. Uh, if you don't monitor what happens afterwards, as Phil said, the attacker may be your user and they have an almost unlimited amount of time with the device in their hand. So continually monitoring for failures during device identity attestation, which is something we do for the device to interact with our system, we verify its identity. You must verify that the attestation isn't failing, have alerting and alarm set up, and that changes in behavior are immediately flagged. Device identity attestation will be a part of various factory processes and a final quality control step during device manufacturing itself, and most certainly during interaction with our secure data centers, as the identity allows us to extend our trust and project it from the data center to the device the customer possesses. So telemetry, including real-time monitoring and alerting, as mentioned, of device identity attestation in and out of the factories in the wild is a critical component of our zero trust implementation. So thank you everyone for your attention. I realize we've gone about nine minutes over on our allotted time. So hopefully uh, that doesn't cut into the question period too much. <laughs> um, but uh, so if anyone, anyone does have any questions, I presume they're in the Zoom chat. Um, and we are hiring for all kinds of information security roles. So if you are interested in what we do at Bloomberg or uh, opportunities in New York and London, please see the Bloomberg Careers website. It's careers.bloomberg.com. So please apply, or if you, can, if you can find us, reach out directly to us. So thank you, Phil and Joel, for this amazing informative sessions. And yes, we do got some questions in chat box. So I'll just read it, uh, uh, them for you. So we have one question from Asmita. Uh, she's asking, there are so many best practices, guidelines for IoT security. When you say baseline security requirements, how do you prefer to select those? That is an excellent question. And uh, it's a very personal question in a certain sense. 
it depends on the product you're developing and you really have to um, understand what trading off one particular best practice might uh, result in terms of the actual security or actual delivery of the service of your device itself. One thing we, we touched on, but we didn't really <laughs> belabor as much as we normally do internally is one factor you always have to consider is usability of a device. And oftentimes usability is, is somewhat directly at odds with uh, the security of a design. So it comes down to figuring out what do you want to achieve from a security perspective? For example, do I need to have a unique identity that's unclonable on a device? Do I need to be able to have a certain level of assurance in that identity? Uh, do I need to be able to store long lived key, symmetric keys on the device or can I generate those keys ephemerally, however it may be? Uh, and then understanding how that impacts the user experience and ensuring that your device actually functions as your users expect it to. Joel, did I miss anything on that? No, and I mean, I think you said this maybe without directly saying it, but it's also directly response, you know, related to your threat model, I guess, where, you know, are some of the best practices that you might make if you wanted to keep something protected from a nation state don't apply to us. We're not gonna pot the, the, the thing in epoxy because we're not trying to prevent silicon attacks of someone reading out OTP, it's just not, it's not in our threat model. Um, you know, we have a, a, a number in our heads of what we think a single attack would take to compromise a single device. And our goal is just not to let a compromise of a particular device scale to many devices. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got one more question from So he's asking, in the traditional semi industry, how many chips have the test mode that allows anyone to clear out OTP fuses? It is usually be easily accused with uh, comments or high voltage applied uh, to spiral pin. How do you work uh, with the chip vendor to close any possible backdoor? Uh, because the test mode is usually not hard to access and many ex employees may have the knowledge of test mode. It will post a security risk if you assume your OTP is safe to use. That's a big question. So it's a good question as well, um, because yeah, in the in the end, debug port is your number one enemy. Um, so the 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 uh, best answer for that is is we look for modes you can put the device in where the vendor will tell you that failure analysis is not an option. So. Uh, we'll oftentimes work with devices where um, there will be some level of specification on what test modes are available in what state the device is in. And uh, usually there's a big red warning. And uh, usually that warning merits a significant discussion with the vendor about what the actual impact of enabling certain uh, security flags at that point in the device will lead to. So uh, certain devices that we work on, for example, we know that once we enable the high security mode that disables the SWD or JTAG port, um, or uh, that sets some fuses, anti-fuses that um, may change the behavior of the device permanently, um, we know that at that point we're on our own for those devices. So if something fails, we'll be pretty much toast. But uh, we do know at that point that they've, what we've locked off a good deal of the capabilities the vendors would yeah. have to actually lock that device down. And, and to just echo that, at, at, at some point, trust is a, a business decision, right? We aren't making the ASICs. We don't know about all the test modes. They say there's no way to pull a pin down or pin up to cause it to enter the test mode if you set this. And, and at that point, we have to trust them because we're not capable of an independent audit of the RTL or these things where they just won't provide it, right? And so to the extent that we can close all those doors and have the conversations like, okay, this is what your data sheet says, but no, really, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, the no really com uh, comment is the <laughs> critical part. All right, this is what your data sheet says. Now tell us the reality. Okay, so one more question from uh, Simon is like, do you know about the attacks on the supply chain of your devices? And could you give an example? So I would say, um, so, so I'm gonna say explicitly, we, we do not have any specific examples of supply chain attacks on our devices. Um, that we can share or that we are really like publicly able to discuss. Right, and uh, we're talking about the keyboard and the portable credential yeah. token that we showed earlier. Yep. So uh, this is this is something though that we have dealt with in, in other products in our previous lives where it has happened. Uh, but usually these compromises are not, you know, the NSA trying to get at your secrets or something like that. Usually it actually comes down to someone trying to save a buck and uh, someone who is, is getting in, inserting a shipment of lower cost parts or recovered parts into a more expensive shipment. 
yeah. and then that ends up compromising some aspect of your device at some level. So it's not um, it's not all about the security uh, in this case. I'd like to point out, but it really is specifically um, you know looking at even just how someone might change the way your device functions. Yeah. I, I can say in a previous life, I, I, where I was more involved as the hitman behind the keyboard writing the firmware than the architecture and working on holistic design, I definitely wrote code in a previous life dealing with the fact that legitimate chips fell off the back of trucks and had to make a whitelist to check serial numbers. Like it is a real problem for really huge consumer device vendors. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry, my and we have last question uh, of the session is uh, from Christian. So he's asking, is voltage glitching by compromise untrusted components, a reliability problem like flash, RAM, tempering, or a security problem with hardware, firmware mitigation? Joel, you want to run with this one? Uh, I'll, I'll start and then you can, you can, you can clean up. <laughs> you, can, you can be the cleanup batter. Um, so, you know, depending on the parts you select, the vendor may already claim to have uh, mitigations in place for these sorts of things. Um, it really, it really depends on, on your threat model. You know, if you can amount an attack and get it to cause up the thing and you reverse engineer the thing, very vague sort of things I'm talking about, but basically, you know, the calculus behind our decisions relates to uh, a theoretical time and cost bar to mount an attack and what it would enable them to do. Um, these, these devices aren't protecting nuclear launch codes. They're protecting access to our system um, you had to have a login and password as well. So it, it really all comes down to the, to the threat model. So I would lump it more into the, uh, to the untrusted component as a reliability problem um, than, than the latter. Certainly as far as like our bootloader and landing, landing um, untrusted code, like this is of, a, of keen interest to us. And we've gone through measures to, you know, to, to detect that and to mitigate that. So Phil, what would you add? I think the, the one thing that's, interesting as well is, is a lot of semiconductor devices produced for payment card industry and uh, and increasingly actually and for embedded controllers and such for for larger more complex electronics also tend to have pretty extensive countermeasures built into them today it surprises me the number of uh, you know anti glitching anti clock tampering uh, type countermeasures actually are built in and are more readily available today in these devices these are imperfect but they do help us as well have some assurance against these types of attacks. So while we're not gonna say we have zero concern about you know, a, glitch, a voltage glitching attack against one of our devices, um, we certainly have gone to some lengths to ensure that those countermeasures yeah. work. I mean, for anyone here who's familiar with the crypto wallet attacks on glitching like USB descriptor links and allowing the device to cough up arbitrary you know, data in flash or RAM, and the secrets happen to be right there afterwards for the 12, you know, recovery key. Like those are the sorts of design considerations or best practices to go back to ask me this question that you can kind of take to mitigate these things that maybe you don't have control over. A user has a thing and they're going to try to glitch it or EM it, right? Yep. Okay. So we got one more question. So if you guys <laughs> want to take it because we are already out of time. So it's up to you. Uh, if you want oh. to take it, I can read it for you. We'll take so it. You, we'll can, take you it. can try to answer as short as like. In no, no, we, we're good. Okay, great. So the question from Le is asking, do you ever talk to any of the silicon vendors about some of the countermeasures they might use to reduce counterfeiting of chips during chip production, such as active uh, metering scheme? So that's a, that's a good question. And the answer is sometimes. Uh, we try to know what they're doing for their own supply chain, just to ensure that um, you know our objectives are aligned with their objectives. It's always a, the best outcome is if everyone's aligned. Uh, however, sometimes the, the measures that are actually available to us in, in our production process might not allow us to take advantage of some of the countermeasures they use um, that they could do uh, they can achieve through dye inspection, for example. Uh, puffs are currently a very popular topic for managing this type of issue. So uh, we, we see a lot of cases with vendors now where they're integrating puffs into their design. And then we have some information about all of these, the uh, devices that we have purchased or like, you know, in a PO lot, these are the, these are the associated certificates for the keys that will be generated from these puffs. Uh, so that's been interesting to see that evolve, but we don't really take advantage of um, some of the other schemes that uh, the vendors will use today. Yeah, I mean, and, and this isn't 
direct knowledge that I'm disclosing, but certainly big companies who are very famous that produce their own silicon probably have such schemes as integrating known things into their wafers and dyes, expecting to find things and measuring them at certain places all throughout the test, dicing, you know, and, and key infusion, and are going to take them in house and do all these things. And again, as, as someone who is entirely dependent on merchant silicon, we don't necessarily have that luxury of being looped in at all those stages. Okay, so that was the last question. And thank you, Phil and Joel, once again, uh, for this amazing presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. And, yeah, and hello, participant. Thank you for your attention uh, for today's webinar. I hope to see you guys soon for another hardware.io webinar. Till then, have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy your time. Be safe. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Cheers. Good yeah. evening, everyone in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Cheers.